one to four. Luke chapter one and verses one to four. I turn to those words because they give us a preface Luke's gospel and explain not only his own methods and his own aspirations, but in many ways bring before us what the gospel itself actually is and the whole nature of our Christian faith. And I want to focus on two or three points for a moment. First of all, the fact that this is Luke's gospel. If I ask who wrote it, the answer finally is that God wrote it. It came by inspiration of God. And it is as such a part of the Word of God, inspired in its every utterance and its every statement. And yet God gave it to us through a human personality, through a human author, who wasn't simply a shorthand writer and wasn't simply a scribe, but was in a very real sense the author of this particular gospel. And because of that, it has the stamp of Luke's personality engraven upon it in its entirety. Now, I don't mean that it is, in the absolute sense, original that there's nothing like it anywhere else in the whole world. Because others too had written Gospels. And Luke's Gospel is in many ways similar to those of Matthew and Mark. It is also similar to, to secular histories. It has the same kind of preface, it uses at many points similar language, it shares many of the same basic concerns as secular historians. It is always inevitable that there will be continuity between our Christian work and comparable non-Christian work. And yet, Luke's is Luke's gospel. It is very personally and very individually his. It reflects his experience, his background, preoccupations, interests and concerns. For example, it isn't as Mark's gospel is the work of an uneducated man. This is the work of a self-conscious, trained scholar and a very self-conscious stylist. And again, it's not like Matthew's, the work of a Jew. It is a Hellenistic work that betrays very clearly its own Greek orientation. I emphasize those things because they bring before us what I think is a fundamental principle of all known Christian service. All of us are called to serve God. The whole Bible is given to us to make us as men and women of God thoroughly fitted and equipped for every good work. And if we are to engage in good works, if we are to serve God effectively, then our service is precisely our kind of service. Nobody else 
could have written this gospel. Not Matthew, not Mark, not John, not Paul, not James, not Peter. Nobody but this man could have given God this particular kind of service. Now Luke had many advantages, but Luke also had many limitations. And yet, notwithstanding those limitations, he offers to God this particular kind of service. It bears the marks of his strengths and the marks of his weaknesses. It is the product of all that he was by the common grace and by the special grace of God. Now tonight, we represent here a wide variety of talent, of experience, education, aptitude. There is no point in wishing we were somebody else. We have our own gifts, our own opportunities, our own training. We have also our own inbuilt limitations that we can't escape from and can't transcend. God doesn't ask of us a service beyond our capability. And God is not content with a service that reflects less than our capability. And I just want to lay down the challenge that each one of us be willing to be ourselves before God, to know what we cannot do, but then to know also what we can do, and to give to God not some stereotyped and some flat, colorless service which has no name, no individuality, no stamp of our own uniqueness, but to offer to God that which has passed through the alembic of our own minds and our own souls. And we can say to God, this is my service, my offering, my sacrifice. This is what I do for you in response to what you have done for me. And so there it is, first of all, this is the gospel according to Luke. It has Luke's personality written all over it. And my second concern is this. The actual content of this gospel. You see how he puts it. It is an orderly account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Verse 1 an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, it is concerned with events, it's concerned with occurrences, it is concerned with facts. That means at one level that this is not a biography. It's not a story of the inner life of Jesus. It doesn't, for example, draw on the diaries of the Lord Jesus and indicate from them the development of his own inner life. It doesn't focus on a psychological development. It doesn't tell us the influences that made him what he was. It doesn't show us the, the growth of his thought. It doesn't look inward in any substantial measure at all. It is a story very much of the outward and the public life of the Lord Jesus. And similarly, it isn't a book about the teaching of Christ. It doesn't focus on his worldview, on his peculiar doctrines, on his distinctive ideas. 
there have been many studies of what's called the theology of Luke. And these studies are thematic. They look at various doctrines which are peculiar to this apostle, this evangelist. But that's not Luke's own method. He doesn't look at the Lord's inner life, and he doesn't look simply at the great themes of the Lord's teaching. Instead, he tells us a story, the things that have been fulfilled, the occurrences. And he says, this is what happened. And it is on those happenings that Luke focuses. He tells of the birth of Christ and says this is how it was. He tells of the baptism and the transfiguration and the crucifixion. He says the Lord Jesus told those parables. The Lord performed those miracles. He says those things actually occurred and this is the way that they occurred he tells us this great story and if you go to the old testament you find exactly the same reality you find the story of god's dealings with his people you don't find much time spent for example on cosmogony there is one chapter that tells us how this world was created. You know, that's a remarkable fact. One chapter on how this world came into being. Now, it may be that that process in its totality took many billions of years. And yet, it's told in one chapter. And the story of the passion of Jesus Christ occupies half of Matthew's Gospel, some 15 chapters, and half of Luke's Gospel too. Because that's the Bible's sense of proportion. At the moment, you see, there is enormous interest in cosmogony, in the Big Bang Theory and so on. Because men find that so fascinating, all those metaphysics. But the Bible tells a story of the people of God. One chapter on creation. And then the story of Noah and of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses. Because in many ways they are more important than the story of creation. And the same in the New Testament, the focus falls on the things that have been fulfilled, the things that have happened among us. Well, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us this, that God himself has got involved in human history. That God himself has erupted and God has acted. In this world where we sinned, in this world where we suffer, God has done things, God has fulfilled things in Jesus Christ. We have a gospel not of great themes or of great ideas or great values or great speculations, but a story in sequence, more or less, of things that happened. When Caesar wrote his history of his campaign in Gaul and France, he said, this is what happened. The same Winston Churchill in the Second World War, Churchill tells us, this is what happened. And Luke similarly tells us, this is what happened. This is the story of what God did. God's son, born of a virgin. God's Son crucified on the cross of Calvary. God's incarnate Son attacking demon possession and disease and so on. And those, those great miracles performed by the incarnate Savior. These things actually happened. 
The gospel is the story of what God did in history itself in our human situation. And that's what we need. We ask in the face of death, do the dead rise? And it's no use men simply patting us on the head and trying to give us some abstract comfort. We need the comfort of facts. And the great comfort is the fact of the empty tomb surely fulfilled among us. We ask, does God understand pain? Has God ever suffered? And the answer is again, yes, God suffered in his own son. God's son was crucified. God's son faced death. God's son experienced all the death means physically. And God in his son understands our pain because of the fact of his own involvement. We need to know the fact. We ask, has our sin been dealt with? Has our guilt been dealt with? Again, the answer is yes. In the great fact, the great event, the occurrence on the cross of Calvary, where the Son of God bore what was due to our sin. And that is Luke's great constant concern. Not themes, not values, but those facts surely fulfilled among us. And the third point I want you to notice is this. I want you to notice Luke's thoroughness. How painstaking he was as a historian. Now bear in mind that Luke had many advantages. For one thing, he wrote by inspiration. For another, he lived in the very milieu in which all those events occurred. He was in touch with the facts and he lived close to the events themselves. For another, he was companion to the Apostle Paul. He had then all these advantages. And he might have said, well, as one living so close to the events, as one knew the Apostle Paul, as one led by God's Spirit, I don't need to take too much trouble. But he didn't say that at all, you see. Instead, he tells us this. I have looked at the other written accounts. Many others, he says, have undertaken to provide such accounts. And I have seen those other written accounts. And furthermore, I have spoken to the eyewitnesses. I've asked those who saw the event. I thus, those who saw the temptation, those who saw the Baptist and the Transfiguration, and Gethsemane, and the cross, I've asked them, well, just what happened? I've talked to them and got their precise and detailed records of just how it was on those occasions. And he says this to us too, in verse 3, I myself, have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I have gone right back to the beginning. I have gone back to the birth of our Lord, to its antecedents, to the first announcement of his imminent arrival in this world. I have gone back to the very beginning. I have asked all the questions. I've checked all the documents. I've spoken to all the witnesses. I have checked and double-checked. I have carefully investigated. This man doesn't say, I'm writing poetry. He doesn't say, I'm writing theology. He doesn't say, I'm writing legends and myths, no matter how moving. He doesn't say, I'm writing fables, he says to us. I have checked and double-checked everything in this narrative. 
This man is a model of painstaking thoroughness, of conscientious accuracy. He is an immaculate example for all us engaged in the kind of research. I have subjected this, he says, to the most minute investigation. And why do I say that? And why is it so important? Why well, you look for a moment at verse 4? So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Now, it's not saying to them, you can be sure of those great Christian values. It's not saying to them, you can be confident of those great ideas proposed by Jesus Christ. But he's saying to them, you can be absolutely confident that things happened exactly as I have described them. That you may know the certainty of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now tonight, there are many thousands in this land, especially in our great academies, and they have no trouble at all with the values of the Christian faith. They have great sympathy with many outstanding leading ideas, but they simply cannot live with the facts they cannot bring themselves to believe that these things happened. That's why Luke's preface is so important. I have thoroughly investigated these things. I have checked all the documents. I have spoken to all the witnesses. I have compared. I have collated. I have sifted. I have analyzed so that you may have the certainty of the things that you have been taught. And that brings us tonight to what is basic and bedrock Christianity, the factuality and the facticity of the great events of the Gospel of the New Testament. What does Luke mean? Well, he means this, that what we have in the story of the virgin birth is literal history. I don't say for a moment that this is ordinary history. But I say this, the facts are as Luke alleges. The angel came, the angel announced, you will bear a son, although you are a virgin. And that son will be the son of God. And it happened like that. Born without human paternity. Born in a supernatural way. Born under a sign that says, this is the finger of God. This is a new beginning for mankind. This is not a moment of evolution as if Jesus Christ were the precipitate of the human gene. It isn't that way at all. But this is a new creation. And Luke says, I have checked it out. I suppose he had spoken to Mary herself. He had spoken to those who knew Mary well, to whom she had told the story. I have checked. I have double-checked. And she was absolutely certain there was an angel. She knows what that angel said. And she was adamant about the great central fact that her son, Jesus Christ, was born of a virgin. You must know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And that fact at the very outset of this gospel, stamps on Jesus Christ, 
the status of absolute uniqueness of discontinuity with all that has gone before. This is the new man who is the last dad who is the son of God. That's what he is. The redemptive eruption of the might of God within human history. You can, Luke says, be absolutely sure that's the way it was. The same applies to the story from Luke chapter 7 of the widow of Nain's son. You may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. It's no use with the modern saying, oh, we know that he said beautiful things. We know he did wonderful things, but not please a story that says that a man rose from the dead, the widow of Nain's son. Surely it's symbol, surely it's myth. Surely they say that's not history, that is supra history, that is legend. No, Luke says. You can go today to the village of Nain near Tiberius, it's still there. And you can see that village where the Son of God went one day and he met this cortege and he saw this broken-hearted widow weeping at the bier of her only son and the Lord's heart was touched and he touched the bier and that son was restored to his mother now he says I checked it out I've read the written accounts. I've spoken to the eyewitnesses. And that is exactly what happened. The man was dead. The man rose. Many of the times, the same thing happened, Luke would tell us, the house of Jairus, for example. This man, this Christ, not only said beautiful things, not only did some intriguing things, but he was indeed the Lord of life. He moved with calm, majestic assurance amid the forces of nature, the forces of the demonic, the forces of death itself, and he showed his authority. And he says, you can be absolutely sure that's the way it was. And that's what really happened. But again, the story of these men on the road to Emmaus. What a beautiful story. In every sense of the word, it is so moving, it is so powerful. But the important thing is this. You may know the certainty of those things that have been fulfilled among us that Jesus Christ lived not only in the memory of his disciples not only in the immortality of his teaching or even the immortality of his soul but it happened as Luke says in that story of the two on the road to Emmaus I've checked it out I've read the document I've talked to the people involved. After his crucifixion, they were walking along the road to Emmaus, and that too is still there. And as they walked, the stranger drew alongside them. And after a time, it became clear that he was the very Jesus who had been crucified and dead and buried. And there he was, literally and physically and totally alive. And we saw him and we spoke to him and he spoke to us. And these men, they had no doubt about it. He had been crucified and dead and buried. And there he was, he was alive, he was risen from the dead. And Luke says, you can be absolutely sure. That's exactly how it was. Well, tonight, do we face those facts? The certainty 
other things that have been fulfilled among us. There are those who say to me that this isn't their thing, Christianity. It's not their thing. There are those who mention that this faith has a claim upon our minds only when we feel a sense of need or feel some conviction of sin or face some crisis. And I want you to face this. The challenge of the simple facticity of the virgin birth. The simple facticity of that story of the widow of Nain's son. The simple facticity of the road to Emmaus. I want to ask you, does Luke deserve to be believed? Was he competent? Was he thorough? Was he careful? Had he made proper investigation? And I ask you, what more could he have done? And I ask you this, suppose you know the certainty Suppose beyond a moment's dubiety, you are convinced that God is, that Jesus Christ is a son, that he was born of a virgin, that he raised the dead, was crucified for sins, rose from the dead, and one day will return again. Suppose you are certain I ask you two questions. How do you feel about it? Not only in your minds, but in your emotions. How do you relate? How do you feel about somebody who has risen from the dead? And I ask you this too. What are you going to do about it? You cannot walk round it. You cannot walk away from it. You cannot retreat into benevolent neutrality. You cannot say, I have nothing against him. You can't say, I quite like him. You can't say, I'm quite interested. You can't say I have nothing against him if you are certain. As you have every right and every obligation to be certain. How do you feel about it? What are you going to do about it? There is only one question in the whole world that matters. And it's this. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Everything turns on that. If he didn't rise from the dead, then I cast my vote for unbelief. In its darkest, most negatives, most negative, coldest, and terrifying form. But if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that's the fulcrum of history. That's the goal of history. That's the fulfillment of history. That is the single greatest challenge you will ever face your entire life. There is nothing in you, Rod, like that empty tomb, which look so carefully investigated, and with regard to which Luke was so absolutely certain. And I'm asking, what are you doing with this? The certainty of the things you have been taught. 
Those things, that certainty, that empty tomb, that commands here and now the intellectual, emotional, practical allegiance of every man and woman and every boy and girl in this audience tonight. Are you prepared to give it that allegiance? May God help us to do so. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we bless thee for thy word. We thank thee for its majesty. We thank thee for its knowledge of ourselves. We thank thee for the assurance it conveys to us, for the certainty it establishes with regard to the great foundations of our faith. Blessed to each one of us, help us face its claim and its challenge, and pardon us all our sin for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our closing praise is Psalm 107. From verse 15 to verse 21, the tune is spar. Oh, that men to the Lord would give praise for his goodness then. Psalm 107 from verse 15, we shall stand to sing. 